Your lecturer is Master of Wine Jennifer Simonetti Bryan. Master of Wine Jennifer Simonetti Bryan is one of only a few hundred people in the world and only 31 in the United States to achieve the title of Master of Wine, the highest qualification in the global wine community. She has five industry certifications, including a professional certificate in spirits from the Wine and Spirit Education Trust and is a certified specialist of spirits. She has instructed for the Wine and Spirit Education Trust and has trained thousands of industry professionals. See these glasses? Each one contains some of the finest spirits in the world. And whether you like to drink vodka, the most popular spirit in America, or cognac, one of the most luxurious spirits in the world, spirits have no limits. Hi, I'm Jennifer Simonetti Bryan, and I've trained thousands of professionals in the spirits and wine industry and judged numerous international spirits competitions. I've put together six jam-packed lectures about all of these spirits so that I can pass my experience and tips along to you. In the next six lectures, I'll teach you about the most common spirits and what makes them uncommon. I'll teach you how they're made and how to appreciate them straight up or even in a cocktail. I'll show you how to tell the good from the bad and the best from the good. Throughout these lectures, we'll have demonstrations with tastings with spirits. You'll still get a lot out of the lectures even if you don't have any of the spirits in front of you, but if you're able to taste along with me, that's all the better. I recommend getting one, a few, or if possible, all of the spirits that we're going to be covering in each lecture. You'll learn more if you're tasting with me because you're going to be interacting with the information in an entirely different way. There's a list in your guidebook of what we taste in each lecture, as well as recipes for the classics and trend-setting cocktails we'll make. I'll also let you know at the end of each lecture what you'll need for the next one. You may want to invite some of your friends to watch a lecture with you and ask them to bring along a bottle to kind of keep costs down. Unlike wine, many spirits come in in very small bottles, just like the one you see on airplanes, and that can be easier on your budget. Another option is to listen to each lecture and then go to a restaurant or bar with a friend to compare and contrast the tastes. I mean, every bar has at least one of each of these categories. The purpose of this course isn't to make you a distiller or a bartender. What I want to give you is a, a great overview of the flavors and tastes and, under, and an understanding of why certain spirits taste the way they do and some fun facts and insider tips. Vodka was the drink of Peter the Great and the Russian Tsars going back to the 1400s. In our own time, there was a vodka called Diva that sold at auction for more than one million dollars. When the vodka was poured, it was actually filtered through precious gems. Gin was a favorite of the author of The Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Its most classic cocktail, the martini, is often counted among the most civilized drinks in the world. By the way, did you know that a shaken martini is weaker than a stirred one? Think about it. Whiskies include rye, Irish whiskies, bourbon, and single malt scotches. The layers of flavors in whiskies can unfold and delight for hours, and some are sold at only the highest priced auctions. Then we have rum. Rum, which comes in light and dark varieties. This was favored by Ernest Hemingway, who would sip mojitos in the tropics. But in the 1600s, rum was the most popular drink in America. And in those days, the quicker the turnaround between distilling and drinking, the better. But these days, aged rums are prized. Then we have tequila and mezcal, which come to us from Mexico. The ancient Aztecs believed that the gods brought them the agave plant, which was then turned into pulque, a sweet, milky, fruity drink, and used mainly by the priestly class. In the 1500s, the Spanish conquistadors took pulque and used it to make mezcal, North America's first distilled beverage. Do you think tequila's a cheap spirit? Well, years ago, a one liter bottle of a limited edition premium tequila sold for $225,000 which at the time was the most expensive bottle of spirit ever sold. Bet you're not thinking it's so cheap now. Liqueurs and cordials offer colors and flavors for cocktails. Van Gogh and Oscar Wilde, for example, were known fans of the liqueur absinthe, which was considered an inspiring, if addictive, muse. 
especially by Parisian artists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Brandies are produced by distilling wines. Cognac houses have a master taster who sample thousands of brandies each year before approving them for blending in their house cognac. Wouldn't you like that job? I know I would. If you're going to be tasting along with me today, you're going to need the following spirits. Russian Standard Vodka, which is a wheat or grain-based vodka, Chopin, or a potato-based vodka, and London Dry Gin. At the end of this lecture, we'll make some cocktails with Eric Holzer, a mixologist at Wisdom. We'll create two cocktails, a Bloody Mary and the Classic Martini. Now let's take a look at wine versus beer versus spirits. The origin of wine seemed to be a happy accident. The story goes that a goat herder noticed his flocks being a little friskier than usual, and uh, after they had been eating some what he thought were rotting grapes on nearby vines. The grapes have their own sugar and their own yeast on the skins, so the grapes actually weren't rotted grapes, but they were fermented grapes. And presto, you have wine. Beer is another ancient alcoholic beverage, actually possibly dating back to the early Neolithic age, or 9500 BC. But it involves more labor and more steps than making wine, such as malting and, and mashing before fermenting. Spirits actually came along much later than wine or beer. In the 8th century, an Arabic scientist named Habir ibn Hayyan, he was later called Geber, experimented with distilling wine and condensing the vapor in a, in a serpent coil, immersed in water. And then Eureka, the birth of spirits. It was probably meant to be medicinal, and if you ask me, it definitely has some healing powers. How many times have you seen a cowboy in a movie saunter up to a bar and say, give me a shot of whiskey? A million times, right? But do you know how much that cowboy is actually drinking? Technically, a shot in the United States is about 1.5 ounces, or 44 milliliters, of alcohol, and comes in a glass, you know, such as this one, a shot glass. When you hear someone say, give me a double, it actually means two shots, or three ounces, or 88 milliliters. The bartender pours, and the cowboy just kicks it back. We won't be doing any of that in this course, actually. Why? Well, first, we'll be drinking better stuff than the cowboy used to, so you would totally miss out on an incredible taste experience. And second, the purpose of this course is to appreciate and taste, not just kick it back and get drunk. Even with sipping, I want you to make it to the end of this lecture. So how can you get the most out of drinking spirits? We do this with what I call the four S's of tasting. See, sniff, sip, and savor. With wine, we actually have an additional S called swirl. Wine is swirled around in the glass to release more aromas into the glass so that your nose can pick it up. With spirits, though, the aromas are really volatile enough. If you're going to swirl, you're releasing more volatile alcohol aromas, which will reach your nose first. And, you know, you'll definitely feel that alcohol burn in your nostrils. And, you know, it may cover up some of the flavors. With spirits, then we omit the swirling and begin with seeing, taking note of the color. Looking at a spirit's color can give us an idea of what the spirit will actually taste like. For example, if it's a brown spirit like the one I'm holding here, I'm likely to expect flavors that are associated with barrel aging, which is where the color comes from. These flavors and aromas include like spice, vanilla, caramel, or even toffee. If the spirit is white, I would expect to smell some of the base material or other flavorings, but not oak. Because a clear white spirit wouldn't immediately indicate to me that it was oak aged. Next, we move on to sniffing. With wine, you sniff deeply, but wine is only about 13% level of alcohol. Spirits are generally 40% level of alcohol or more. If you inhale deeply, you're actually going to anesthetize your nose. So that will prevent you from smelling anything else. So trust me, you know, because I did this for the first time I was tasting spirits, and I instantly got a headache. When you're sniffing spirits, you want to keep your mouth open and inhale both through your nose and through your mouth while sniffing spirits. If I tilt my glass and inhale, I get actually more aromas out of that. So keeping your mouth open reduces the alcohol burn that you can get, and which can cover up some of the flavors if you don't. Note that spirits I have here are neat, which means straight up. And that means that nothing else has been added to it. It's just plain spirit. That's it. 
Whiskey connoisseurs sometimes add a, about a drop of water to the glass. The additional water mutes some of that alcohol and allows some more of the other flavors to come through. You might want to try this whenever you're tasting a new spirit. This also explains why some people drink spirits on the rocks. Not only does the water from the melting ice dilute some of the alcohol burn, but the ice also chills the spirit, which can make the experience smoother and more palatable. Your first sip of spirits will be a shock to your system um, because of the intensity of the alcohol, about 40%. It's usually a good idea to take a sip to get your palate calibrated and then wait about 30 seconds or maybe a minute. After that, it's not a shock. I usually take less than a teaspoon of spirit into my mouth, roll it around for a few seconds, and then swallow. Whether you're sipping along with me or not, you can get a sense of the spirit if you put a drop of the spirit in your hands, rub them together, and then smell them. Now, I know this sounds odd, um, but the friction actually forces the alcohol to evaporate and you're left with the aromas. This can help you identify some subtle characteristics behind the spirit. Finally, we get to savoring. I think of savoring as separated into time periods. After you take your first sip, the first few initial seconds when you take a sip is called the attack. You will smell one set of components here, and then it's usually the most volatile components that get to your receptors. A few seconds after that, after the attack, you're going to notice a different set of flavors. This is called the mid-palate. That's when they start to kick in. Then you have something called the finish. The finish reveals an entirely an other set of flavors. Those that linger on your palate for about 10 seconds or 20 seconds or more. Now the term complexity refers to the number of different flavors you get with a spirit. The more layers of flavors, the more complex it is. How long this experience lasts depends on the spirit itself. The higher the quality of the spirit, the longer the flavors last on your palate. This is called a spirit's length. We're starting our lectures with vodka and gin. Why them? Everyone knows vodka. Many sources rate it as the number one spirit in the United States. It's fairly neutral, definitely in comparison to some other categories, so it's an easy way to start. Vodka is also the base spirit for a variety of different types of spirits, such as bitters, liqueurs, and gin. All right, just for fun, pick up the vodka and the gin. See the differences between them? Nothing in color, right? Now smell them side by side. First the vodka, then the gin. Wow, huge difference, right? Though they both look the same, there is a significant difference between them in aromas and in flavor. Gin is super powerful in, in flavor and shows the impact of what flavoring neutral spirits can do. Both are clear spirits and what we call white spirits. And this makes them extremely mixable, very mixable and usable for cocktails. They're also great for making some cocktails in lowering calories. So you can check those out in our bonus lectures. The word vodka comes from the Slavic word voda for water. Throughout these lectures, you will hear many references to water, water of life, aqua vitae, and so on when it comes to spirits. And it's easy to see why. The spirits look like water. Russia and Poland both argue over who made the first vodka. According to the Gin and Vodka Association, the first documented production of vodka was in Russia in the late 9th century. The first known vodka distillery was documented almost 200 years later in Russia. But Poland lays claim to having distilled vodka even earlier in the 8th century. Other sources put the date uh, closer to about the 12th century. Vodka, by definition, is a neutral spirit. In fact, the EU regulations state that vodka should be distilled and filtered so that the organoleptic characteristics of the base material are selectively reduced. In other words, so it's clear and neutral. What is meant by the term base material? Vodka can be made from any fermentable agricultural product. Some of the more premium vodkas are made from grains, such as uh, barley, rye, or wheat. And then you have something with potatoes. You can make vodka with maize or molasses, but these can be a little sweet. Vodka producers can use grapes such as Ciroc, a French vodka, sugar beets, or onions. They're all allowed by the EU. 
You may have heard that Polish vodkas are all made with potatoes, while Russian vodkas are made with other materials. That's only partially true. While there are indeed Polish vodkas that are made with potatoes, such as Chopin, Poland also produces high-end rye-based vodkas, such as Belvedere Vodka. Absolute, which is Sweden's best-known brand, and it's made from uh, winter wheat, while Finlandia Vodka from, obviously, Finland, is from barley. Here we have two vodkas, one made by Russian Standard, which is a wheat vodka, and Chopin, which is actually made from potatoes. Let's do our four S's. Take the Russian Standard, C, sniff, sip, and savor. You're going to notice some of the kind of wheat and cereal notes in that, and feel the, the structure on your palate. Now taste the one made with potatoes. Mm. I think you're going to find that the one made with potatoes actually has a, a creamier texture and it's kind of rounder on the palate, and, you, and they taste quite different. And also you'll notice that uh, the one made with wheat is a little bit lighter in structure, but both of them are still very smooth. People have very different preferences for their vodkas, and you may want to try a variety to see what you like best for certain occasions and in different cocktails. We've gone through the conversion and fermentation processes, but we don't have yet a spirit. We now need to go through distillation. Distillation works on the principle that alcohol has a lower boiling point than water. If you boil wine or beer or other wash with alcohol in it, the alcohol boils first at about 173 degrees Fahrenheit or 78.3 degrees Celsius. The water then boils at about 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. In wine, beer, and any other alcoholic beverages, there are compounds called congeners. These compounds are responsible for all the aromas and flavors. During distillation, they turn into a vapor along with the alcohol molecules. The more volatile or lighter compounds vaporize earlier. At lower temperatures, the heavier ones vaporize at higher temperatures. Distillation is done in vessels called stills. Broadly speaking, there are two categories of stills pot stills, and column stills. We're going to be talking about stills in each lecture because the type of still has a significant impact on flavor. Pot stills provide spirits with a bit more character and flavor, while column stills are generally noted for their speed of distillation and their neutrality. Pot stills are so-called because the wash, remember that's the term referred to the result of fermentation, is boil in a pot over heat stores. The wash boils in the pot, the alcohol and vapors all rise up, get captured, and go through a coil that's immersed in water. That's where they condense back into a liquid. The pot still is a batch system. Let's say you put in a wash at about 8% alcohol. The first batches pass through. This pot still creates a liquid with an alcoholic strength of about 23%. It now has to be sent back through the system a few more times to get up to the alcoholic strength for spirits from 58 to 80 percent alcohol. While you do see pot distillation with some vodkas, such as Kettle One Vodka, you will hear more about pot stills when we talk about uh, whiskey and cognac in later lectures. Column stills are sometimes called continuous stills. They were invented later than pot stills to make distillation faster, less labor-intensive, and more neutral. Instead of passing through the still a few times in batches, as we did with the pot still, the wash goes through a column still only once. But the spirit that comes out is about 90 to 95 percent alcohol. See how efficient that is? This is why many vodkas and the base material for gin go through column stills. Column stills are so-called because they involve two tall linked columns, both with plates and trays. Unlike with pot stills, the cold wash is not heated in a, in a pot with a fire underneath, but, it, but it's heated actually by vapor. The wash goes down through the first column called the rectifier in a copper coil. And as it does, it's heated by a steam vapor rising up and surrounding that coil. By the time it reaches the second column called the analyzer, 
the wash is at temperature where the alcohol started to boil, but not the water. As the wash is pouring down the second column, the alcohol and flavor molecules are rising and concentrating. The condensing alcohol keeps circulating in the rectifier until it gains the desired strength. The column stills have different perforated plates through which the vapors flow. The master distiller knows exactly where these plates are for the appropriate cut or range of alcohols to take and collect. The first molecules to distill are the most active and volatile. That's why they're first. But unfortunately, some of these are harmful to us, such as methanol. So the distiller doesn't include the first fraction of vapor, and we refer to this as the heads. The last fraction of molecules to vaporize is known as the tails. These are usually heavier compounds that take longer to vaporize, but the tails also include some compounds that are toxic to us. The distiller needs to do away with the heads and the tails and try to get at that heart, that middle fraction that contains alcohol that's not toxic to us and is loaded with all kinds of wonderful flavor compounds. Where the master distiller makes this cut has an impact on flavor. Those spirits with a heart range earlier on may have a more high-toned aromatic characteristic, while cuts made lower will have more weight to them. Next, the vodka is filtered through charcoal to soften it. Take away some impurities as well as eliminate color. After this, water is added to bring the spirit to bottling strength, about 40% alcohol by volume. And there you have it, vodka. Flavored vodkas are created by macerating the flavoring agent in the vodka at room temperature. Blending in natural extracts or leaching, for example, like passing the vodka through a flavoring agent such as bison grass, but some producers redistill with flavoring agents. The cheapest method, though, is just to add artificial flavorings. You don't have to buy flavored vodka. You can do what is called infusing it yourself. It's a simple process, and in our bonus lectures, I'll show you how. You can make savory or sweet vodkas, and here I have a raspberry vodka, great in cocktails, and when you strain out the fruit, you can use that over ice cream. Here I have a chili pepper vodka, Good with a Bloody Mary. Some folks actually like vanilla vodka, which is great with sweet drinks. That brings me to one of the differences between vodka and gin. Even though these two spirits are both great mixed with tonic water, vodka is easier to mix with, some, with more flavors. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at how gin is made for the answer. Gin is a neutral spirit flavored with botanicals, and by EU law, it must taste predominantly of juniper. Juniper is a plant that is part of the cypress family, and its berries are very pungent. They were often used in medicines. In Holland in 1572, Dr. Franciscus Silvius found that juniper berries covered up the harshness of alcohol and actually made the medicines he made more palatable. His was the first recorded eau de vie from juniper, and he called it Genève. About a century later, when William of Orange ascended the British throne, he encouraged distillation because it helped with local grain surpluses. Also, he had declared war on France at the time, and all the imports, including spirits, were banned. So there was, really was a good deal of incentive to make your own. British producers of Geneva, now called gin, saw an explosion of popularity because it was patriotic and it was cheap. By 1803, nine producers who were called the Gin Barons owned 90% of London's distilling capacity. They included names that you may recognize today, like Booth, Burnett, Gordon, and Tanqueray. Gin can be made in two ways. First, there is distilled gin, in which the neutral spirit that results from the process we talked about earlier with making vodka is redistilled with botanicals. Then there is compounded gin, which is made by adding more botanical essences. Juniper legally has to be present in gin, and a good gin should smell of at least, you know, some subtle notes of juniper. Some of the other botanicals you might see include coriander seed, which gives kind of a, a peppery aroma, angelica root, which gives an earthy or woodsy kind of flavor, orris root, which kind of a floral smell like violets, and dried citrus peels for a fruity kind of flavor. There are many other spices, such as cinnamon or licorice or cardamom and, and, and so on, that can be used. But the formula of botanicals for each producer is a heavily guarded secret, and 
has a major impact on the flavor. Other elements that affect the flavor include how the gin is distilled and how long those botanicals are macerated. And that just means soaking in the liquid until they soften. Beefeater macerates botanicals in the spirit 24 hours before distillation, while Tanqueray adds botanicals to the still and then distills immediately. Bombay Sapphire and Hendrix use stills that have botanicals suspended in a basket on the neck of the still. The original gins were very juniper heavy and, and sweetened, likely to make them more drinkable. But this became known as the Old Tom style. London Dry Gin, on the other hand, has more flavors provided by the citrus peel and, and spices and other things. And they don't have any added sweeteners or coloring agents. Only water is permitted to bring it to a bottling strength. Before we make our cocktails, let's try our four S's with Beefeater Gin, a London Dry Gin. By the way, Beefeater is the only London gin still made in the city itself, and only six people know its secret formula combining juniper and botanicals. So now, we're going to start with C. It looks very clear. It kind of looks like water. Now we sniff. You can smell some of that juniper. It's very, very pungent. It's a, it's a little, it almost reminds me of kind of a, a eucalyptus kind of aroma. But you get some other notes in there as well, some dried citrus peels and, and other floral notes as well. Now sip and savor. You're gonna notice how long um, the flavor is on your palate. And you're gonna roll it around your tongue so you kind of feel the weight and the structure. But notice how those botanicals persist on the palate. Very dr different from drinking vodka. So now let's turn to mixologist Eric Holzer from Wisdom so we can see how to make three classic vodka and gin drinks. The Bloody Mary, the Martini, and a variation on the Martini called the Wisdom Martini. I'm gonna make for you a classic Bloody Mary. It's a very easy drink to play with and be creative with. We start with a Collins glass filled with ice. First ingredient is vodka. We are doing a two ounce pour. I'm using a standard medium grade vodka. I wouldn't go very high end on this. Uh, the one exception that would be kind of fun is using an infused vodka. A bacon or a pepper spiced infused would accentuate the drink. The reason I recommend using a uh, medium grade vodka is because the intensity of the other ingredients uh, will fight any premium vodka. You're not gonna really notice it. Next up is the tomato juice. We are doing four ounces of tomato juice. What's key in this drink, like it is in most cocktails, are the ratios. Bloody Marys are fun because you can be very creative with it. You can uh, throw a lot of different spices, do your own touch. The key is the ratios of the tomato juice and the liquor that you're using. Next, we're gonna do fresh squeezed lemon, half a lemon. Fresh squeezed is key. It's key in all cocktails. It makes all the difference in the world when you use fresh ingredients versus bottled products. After that, we're gonna use a pepper sauce rather than Tabasco, that's our little twist. And we're gonna do one of three heavy dashes. Next up, Worcestershire. We're gonna do two dashes, or three. Three pinches of pepper, and two pinches of salt. Stir it up, and garnish with the celery stick. This is the classic Bloody Mary. I have the pleasure of making you the martini, the classic cocktail, the most notorious in history. Wrongly made many times, and today we're gonna to try to correct that. Two simple ingredients, gin and vermouth. We're gonna start with a tin, three quarters filled with ice, and do 2.5 ounces of gin. I'm using my favorite gin. The second and final ingredient is vermouth. It's important to realize that vermouth is a fortified wine, and as a wine, it can go bad, it can turn. And if you put bad wine in a cocktail, it's gonna be a bad cocktail. It's best when using vermouth to refrigerate it, and you can extend the shelf life four to six weeks. 
Vermouth is a very key ingredient to this cocktail. To me, it's, it's the glue of a cocktail, not just a martini, but binds strong alcohols and makes it smoother. You cut the, the strength and the harshness of the alcohol by actually adding more alcohol. We're gonna shake the martini for 15 to 20 seconds. Some people prefer their martinis stirred, and they claim that you bruise the gin by doing this. I personally disagree, but it is personal preference. There's no correct way to do it. Next, we'll take our chilled martini glass and strain out of our Hawthorne strainer. In this case, I'm gonna do a double strain, which is using this fine mesh strainer. The purpose of this is to remove the small ice crystals that are formed from the heavy shaking. Some people really love the layer of ice crystals on top of their martini, which is fine. But in this case, I'm removing the ice crystals so that the first sip of the martini is as consistent as the last sip and doesn't get further watered down. Finally, the garnish. We can garnish with olives, we can garnish with a lemon twist, or use no garnish. In this case, I'll use a lemon twist. Release some of the oils. And there you have your standard martini. I wanted to create something fresh and uh, more genuine. And so we came up with the wisdom version of an apple martini. I am using uh, Zubrowka, bison grass vodka. It's a Polish vodka that was actually illegal for years in this country since the 70s and recently became legal. Um, it had unknown aphrodisiac qualities and that's why they legalized it. Thankfully, it's now legal. So we'll be doing 1.5 ounces of Zubrowka. You can also use a regular vodka and it will taste great, but the creaminess and the, the texture of the Zubrowka is what makes this drink amazing. Next up, we're gonna use a German apple schnapps. There's all different brands. Just make sure it's a solid, decent brand. We're gonna use half an ounce of that. Next up, we're gonna use uh, vermouth, dry vermouth. We're gonna use a heavy splash or 0.25 ounces of it. That kind of adds um, a little bit of complexity and also kind of brings the cocktail in together um, as vermouth does in classic martinis as well as craft neo-modern martinis. Finally, we're using pressed fresh apple juice. I'm gonna use one full ounce. We're gonna shake it, because I like to shake things. Insert in a chilled martini glass. There you have the Wisdom Apple Martini. Those martinis were fantastic, weren't they? They not only looked perfect, but they tasted perfect, which brings us to the question of what is a perfect cocktail? You may remember hearing James Bond in the film saying that he wanted his martini shaken, not stirred. But why? What's the difference between shaken and stirred martinis? Well, scientists in Canada actually studied the shaken versus stirred methods and measured the amount of antioxidants between the two. They found that they were indeed more antioxidants in flavor with the shaken. So if you prefer your martini shaken, perhaps that means you want more antioxidants, more flavor, or it just means that you're a big James Bond fan. In the next lecture, we're gonna be talking about the wonderful world of whiskey. For this lecture, you may wanna have handy or invite some friends to bring them the following. A single malt scotch. Make sure to ask for a peated one. An unpeated scotch or Irish whiskey, but make sure that it's unpeated. A bourbon and a rye whiskey. But until then, cheers. <laughs>